Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Debbie Willis, and I, my pronouns are she, hers, and hers, and I lead the DEI certificate program at the University of Michigan Rackham Graduate School. We started the series because scholars wanted to hear from real people, their experiences leading equity, diversity, and social justice efforts. This lead conversation examines how faculty, staff, and student leaders in higher education can address the trauma that marginalized populations in our community are facing due to racism and structural injustice. This session will focus on the Black community. We want to thank you all for joining us today, given all this going on in the world. We appreciate your presence here. You received a prompt that this session is being recorded. Your audio and video has been muted for quality of the recording. However, we encourage you to engage in the conversation through the question and answer portal. We'd love to bring your voices in. If you see a question that you like to hear the response, please like that question. We will ask questions with the broadest interest first. We ask that you remain patient with us as over 1,500 of you registered for this webinar and we received close to 100 questions. We will not get to all of them in one hour. But we are committed to continue the conversation and we invite you to join us. And we'll explain that opportunity a bit later. Structural and systemic racism has been historically evidenced and we've witnessed it publicly a lot in the last few months. It's played out with COVID-19, with African Americans being negatively impacted by this virus within grossly, grossly disproportionate rates. And we've witnessed it in the most recent violence that we've witnessed um, with the murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and Tony McDade. It's trauma on top of trauma and our community is hurting. Our featured guest today will speak to these issues and answer some of their questions, some of your questions. They will introduce themselves and then tell us a little bit about their journey to leadership in this space and some of the work that they're doing on racial equity and anti-racism. Justin, we agreed to start with you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Dr. Willis, for bringing this panel together and having this important conversation. I'm grateful to be able to share my experience and my voice um, on this topic. Um, I'm a dual master's candidate here at the University of Michigan, pursuing degrees in social work and business administration. Um, but before arriving in grad school, I was a returned Peace Corps volunteer serving in Rwanda. And um, after that, focused on fighting the HIV epidemic, which we know disproportionately impacts you know, Black communities. And so as a black queer man and somebody who has been working to fight, you know, the manifestation of racism when it comes to public health, um, I very much know about the impact of racism. And so talking about, you know, racial justice and racial trauma is something that, you know, significantly and directly impacts my life. I know a lot of the times when we're having these conversations, you know, they're emotionally charged. And, it, um, and I was very much uh, coming to grad school was thinking about how can we, how can I contribute to helping people um, increase their emotional intelligence so they can have more effective conversations and dialogue around race and taking action towards racial justice. And so that's why I founded a social venture, Equity Social Venture, which does just that. It helps individuals and organizations increase their emotional intelligence so they're more effective in a work around racial justice using social emotional learning. And so when we think about the dialogues that we have about race, as a black person, I oftentimes think about, you know, the increase in racial stress, um, navigating internalized voicelessness, thinking about the rage I have on these topics. And oftentimes I met with, you know, white and non-black people of color who, you know, are trying to navigate feelings of, you know, being defensive or trying to navigate, maintain their sense of self I mean, their accomplishments um, against the backdrop of white supremacy and whatnot. And so um, I'm very much committed to this work about, you know, what can we do to understand the emotional impact, to understand the impact of trauma, enhance all of our ability to better navigate the emotions around these very um, emotionally charged and challenging yet urgent topics. Thank you, Justin. Angie. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so grateful to be sitting here alongside Justin and Stephen and you, Debbie. I've been working personally and professionally in the DEI space in one capacity or another for 15 years plus. And I have to say that I am still learning every single day. Of late, on a personal level, I am finding deeper ways to show up for Black lives. And though most of my personal work is in white spaces, I am showing up there to center and protect Black lives. Professionally, my commitment is to show up in three distinct ways. With other white colleagues to deepen understanding and empathy for all Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities with fierceness and with empathy. With Black colleagues to listen, to practice community care, and to center healing and transformative justice and with all of us to create spaces for courageous conversations about race. A few of the things that we're doing currently within organizational learning where I serve as the DEI program lead is offering a four week learning opportunity on anti-racism, which is really just a place to start. This will be followed up by addressing systemic racism and invisible racism. And we're working on a digital toolkit called Showing Up which covers the areas of support, solidarity, springboards for conversation, and a section for leaders. I have to say that I am really fortunate to have a diverse leadership team that uh, works with me closely. We have two key partners on our campus as well. It's the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and the Office for Health, Equity, and Inclusion. These leadership teams are all working together to support to advocate, to remove barriers, and to model what it looks like to lead culture change. I'm also really fortunate to be surrounded by kind, loving, amazing human beings who call me out when I act or speak in racist ways, which is a gift for me to learn, to change, and to be a better human being. Steven. Thank you, Debbie, for organizing this and all the others who were involved and everyone else who is participating. I am a social professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies, known as DAS by its acronym, and in the Residential College where I teach in the Social Theory and Practice Program. I'm also the faculty director of the Semester in Detroit Program, which is a program housed in the Residential College, but open to all undergraduate U of M students where they spend a semester living in the city of Detroit, working at a, a, in a community-based internship for which they get course credit and taking other courses um, as, as part of a holistic experience and way of learning um, from and with people in the city of Detroit. My approach to what I do at U of M and to the concerns that have brought us here today are grounded in the field of Black studies. And when I say Black Studies, I mean in the broadest sense of the term as it was um, created really in the late 1960s to include um, African American Studies, Caribbean Studies, African Studies um, under various names, you know, Africana Studies and so forth, which has at its core the, the, the mission, the function of uh, studying and, and, and act, many actions challenging white supremacy and expanding the university. Um, expanding how we think about education and what's known about black people throughout the world um, and that establishing um, an, a direct link between what happens at the university and what happens outside the university. All again with um, the goal of understanding the histories, trajectories, and importantly the struggles of black peoples in this country and throughout the world. My journey uh, to become a Black Studies scholar has many starting points, some of which um, uh, perhaps are not quite clear to me um, in terms of my background and the, the people who um, were important in my life. But one of the most um, clear starting points is my graduate studies at the University of Texas. So I studied uh, economics and then history in graduate school at the University of Texas in the 1990s, which is when Texas was going through affirmative action struggle. And being involved in those struggles uh, helped me to see the role that Black Studies can play, 
helping to see this, the struggles that take place in the university and how they are related to broader struggles in society. Um, and that was reinforced when I came to U of M in 2002, which at that time also was going through affirmative action struggles. And one of the things I um, take from that, those struggles in that moment relative for our conversation today is the language of diversity. So in the 1990s, struggles over affirmative action very much use the language of racial justice and racial diversity. Um, it's a much complicated story, a long story, but um, over the next decade or so, the word racial was dropped from diversity and um, that language diversity has, has survived and more. So um, I think about diversity, equity, and inclusion on our campus and, and more broadly from that vantage point with a critical perspective, which we could say more about over the course um, of the conversation. Uh, finally, I'm part of an organization outside of U of M, the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Nurture Community Leadership, based in Detroit. Um, and it's in that organization and the political spaces that that brings me, I try to bring some of that into my work in the classroom and outside the classroom. And that's part of how I try to engage in the struggles that we're talking about here at U of M. Thank you. Thank you all. So we have a lot of questions. We're going to jump right in. Our first question is, how do we avoid the burden of racial equity and DEI work falling disproportionately on faculty, students, and staff of color? Justin, would you like to start with that, please? Yeah, um, I think I would start by inviting us to reflect on, you know, how we got to this point. You know, let's go back a couple hundred years and think about, you know, who kidnapped, you know, black people from the continent of Africa and brought them here and exploited them and built the society that, you know, built the foundation of the society that we live on today. You know, who wrote and enforced the black codes that, you know, dictated the lives of black people among their, after their emancipation? Um, you know, who participated in white flight and so on and, you know, hiring, you know, creating predominantly white institutions that often excluded, you know, black people? I think, you know, the premise of this question, um, oftentimes people think that, you know, black faculty or, you know, black students bear the burden and responsibility for addressing racial justice and DEI. But I think we really have to look at the people who created these systems and who are benefiting from these systems and who have the disproportionate amount of power to adjust these systems. And so I think, um, you know, it's the people who created the system, the people who have the power to adjust them, who have the, the burden to addressing them today. And there's definitely a role for black people in that. Um, I think, you know, going to your black colleagues and black students to make sure you're doing it right, to make sure that, you know, uh, the steps and actions and plans that you're implementing are, are meeting their standards and their needs. But I think uh, when we look back at, you know, the last time there was, you know, a climate that was similar to this, maybe the 1960s, there's the establishment of the Kerner Commission and the Kerner Report, which really laid out a blueprint for addressing anti-Black racism in this country. So we know that Black people have shared time and time again what they need and, you know, what steps need to be taken to dismantle white supremacy and address anti-Black racism in this country. So the plans are there, and I really think it's up to the people who have built this system and who are benefiting from the system to take action and address it. Thank you, Justin. Our next question is, I feel overwhelmed with a sense of guilt for not doing enough. How can I navigate this space and find a way to take action? Angie, you want to start with that one? Sure. Uh, and I, I want to speak directly to my white fellow human beings who are, who are joining us today. Guilt is a very common response for white people when we begin to take racism seriously. So it's normal and in of itself, it's not problematic. But unhealthy guilt leads to paralysis and inaction. We can actually use our guilt to avoid further engagement and to continue our amnesia and our anesthesia. You can also use guilt to become resentful. And that looks a lot like you are making me feel guilty and that's not fair. You can use your guilt to become incapacitated, which looks a lot like I can't do anything right. I just give up. The thing I want you to consider with me today is that all of these responses are really exempting us from any further action it is serving to protect our position and our privilege. 
and it indirectly is blaming black people or anti-racist whites because we are saying they are causing us to feel guilty. Something I'm really challenged with and that I'm working really hard on that I'd love to invite you with on this journey with me is to consider spending less time thinking about how you feel and spending more time thinking about how your actions and ideas make others feel. For white people, so often we are so desperate to be the good ones or to be seen as the good ones. But when we neglect our responsibility and continue to just cycle in our guilt, what we're really saying to black people is that my feelings are more important than your experience. Mm. Our work as white people is not for us. It's not so that we can feel better. The point of anti-racism work is to protect and center black lives. This is not a space for self-improvement. I have found that guilt can actually be a really powerful motivating factor for change. Healthy guilt can lead to change, to transformation, to new life, to a reimagined future. Racism and our involvement in it cannot be avoided. I didn't choose to be born into a culture of white racism where white racism is embedded, nor did I choose to be socialized into entitlement and superiority. And racism is real and I am involved in it and you are involved in it. And so we really must take responsibility to work against it. So my invitation to you today is really to choose not to confuse guilt with responsibility. And honestly, the best antidote that I know of to guilt is accountability and action. Thank you, Angie. Justin, would you like to add to that, please? I actually, I think Angie really hit a lot of the points I wanted to address there. And so I think, yeah, no need to add. Perfect. Steven, would you like to add or no? Just an amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So our next question, Stephen, you might want to address. We've had many graduate students who plan to be future faculty ask us this question. How can I best facilitate race-related conversations between students in the classroom? Um, well, I think Angie just modeled it, actually. Um, one way is to try to create common space for everyone to participate. Mm -hmm. And I said common space, my thing was common ground. I'm not saying that we're all the same, not saying we're all affected the same. I'm saying that in the classroom, try to create some space where we all have some, we have the, the safety to participate, some investment, and some uh, valuable contribution to make. And this depends on a, a range of things. It depends on uh, circumstances of the class, so the size of the class, the subject matter, you as, as the instructor, your own subject position. I'm thinking, of course, of race, gender, and class, but other things as well. Um, so the, the combination of all those things uh, are really important here. So my answer is speaking in a in broad sense because those recognition of those um, various circumstances is, is crucial. But so, yeah, I think finding some way to create um, some common space, some common or shared stakes in the conversation. One way that I think we can do that um, and again, Angie just spoke to this, or, or preface to this, is to understand what race is and the concept of race. And we have a lot of language about race being a social construct, power, and so forth. Um, figure out how you want to present that. But the point is to show students that race is it's a lie, it's a fiction, but it has these very real and has had these very real consequences and, and impacts. But I think the point of emphasizing that race is something that has been created and, and is recreated, but that is a fiction in the sense that it doesn't do what it purports to do. It purports to, to segment human, human beings into these mutually, discrete, mutually distinct categories, which in fact cannot be done. And then racism ascribes characteristics to those groups and mo most importantly puts them in a hierarchy, racism and white supremacy. Um, but getting students to see that race is created, and that it's a lie, and then this is again where I think uh, Angie's uh, commentary speaks to this, it's a lie we've all been lied to. The lie has different meanings for me than it means for you, but we've all been lied to. And so that can be a starting point. Um, 
and, and find other ways to create that 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 um that space in the classroom. Uh, music, for instance, can be an example. Uh, race is infused in hip hop music, mm -hmm. um, for, for for example. Uh, and many of the students will be familiar with hip hop music, and using that or some other reference that they have some familiarity with, but get them to see how these conversations and these questions and interrogations can be had through things that they are already familiar with. Again, recognizing all the other circumstances that have to be taken into account. Thank you, thank you so much. Our next question, higher education is a system of white supremacy. How do we deconstruct, dismantle, and or reconstruct and rebuild it while we are in it? Justin, can you start with that, please? Yeah, I think there's something beneficial even in the phrasing of the question and just blatantly naming it. So, you know, whites, you know, higher education is, a, you know, an institution of white supremacy. I think we have to be more explicit in our language when talking about, you know, issues of anti-Black racism and white supremacy. And so in doing that, it's also looking at what are some of the manifestations of white supremacy culture that have become more acceptable. And so things like meritocracy or professionalism or, you know, timeliness, timeliness, those are all aspects of, you know, your euro white culture that we are, that are now acceptable but are rooted in white supremacy so we need to be more explicit in naming identifying those things i also think we have to do some introspection and be humble you know we're all we all come to these institutions that are part of these institutions and benefit from them in some way so we need to interrogate and think about the ways in which we individually may be benefiting from white supremacy and participating in it um, I additionally think, um, you know, for people who are doing research for Black, Indigenous, and other communities of color, you know, particularly for white researchers, you know, we can't just research these communities. We have to come alongside them and, and protest and fight for them in whatever way that looks like to you. And so just researching, I don't think, is enough. And I think um, additionally making some noise. I think, you know, during my time here as a graduate student, I haven't been silent on these issues. Um, I've worked with students, um, some of my fellow classmates, write an op-ed to encourage um, our program to be more explicit in anti-racism and anti-oppressive practice within social work. Um, we've taken that and really run with it and um, have worked to hold accrediting bodies accountable. And so, you know, we're really making this national and, and trying to have a systemic answer to these systemic problems. And so hopefully, you know, as, you know, social work is looking to develop their future competencies and um, their accreditation standards, that there will be explicit anti-racist language as a part of that. And so, um, I do think we have to acknowledge that we are in a system that, you know, um, perpetuates white supremacy, but we're also at a point where we can most clearly see the holes and cracks in the foundation and take action to do so. And so it's important that we're using our power and our privilege and our credentials within this space to totally dismantle it from the, to the extent possible. And once we leave these institutions, again, how are we using the power, the credentials, the class that we accrued here in a way that is dismantling and disrupting it, uh, disrupting white supremacy, I think is an important question that hopefully we can continue to reflect on long after we leave uh, these institutions. Thank you. Steven. To start, I have, I think, five quick answers. First, responses. I don't know if they should be thought of as answers. First, okay. I would say we respond carefully and consistently. That is to say that through, through thoughtful um, efforts and recognizing that they will, we will need to carry out these efforts over and over again, multiple times, um, in various settings and, and changing contexts. Second, I would encourage us not to bind ourselves to the rewards and the standards of the academy. And I'm not saying not achieve your degree, not achieve tenure, not do your research and, and publish your papers and books. I'm saying as we do those things, and even as we may achieve the, the accolades and the, the um, advancement and so forth in the institution, if we are serious about confronting white supremacy, then we can't let those be the barometers of how well we're doing. Um, we have other measures by which we should um, judge ourselves, assess ourselves, and continually so. Three, find or create spaces outside the institution that can support, inform, or other ways um, bolster what you're doing in the institution. And that 
mean a variety of things depending on your own location and your circumstances. Um, four, I think we have to recognize and re remind ourselves that DEI is not the same as anti-racist work. Mm -hmm. DEI is not the same as challenging, confronting, dismantling white supremacy. Some DEI work may move in that direction, but some may not. From the institution's perspective, it seems to me that that's not the goal. The goal is not to dismantle white supremacy. Um, so we have to, I, I think, use the DEI space. Um, and, I, and I don't say that to demean anyone who has done or is doing anything under that banner, but recognize what it is and what it isn't, and then find the spaces to make it be what it can be. Um, I mentioned in, in my intro uh, that the word race or racial has been dropped in that, that dialogue within the academy and about the university a couple of decades ago. I wasn't exactly saying that race has been dropped out of DI here, but I'm raising that for a question. And, and it's not to say that I recognize that part of the move to diversity is to expand the range of social identities, spaces of oppression, and um, and liberation that we should be included. I'm, I'm not at all challenging that. Um, but I'm recognizing, I want us to recognize it as debates take place, language moves, that um, we have to be on guard to, to identify what it is we're struggling for and against. And finally, I want to offer again the field of Black Studies as an example, as a model, as it was founded, and as it sometimes, but not always, perhaps not enough, certainly not enough, as it is currently practiced, is inherently, its project was to dismantle white supremacy in the institution. Um, so I want us to look to the Black Studies as a historical project and as a place to mount current struggles and efforts. And for that, I'll just uh, point out that our Black Studies unit here, DAS, was founded in the fall of 1970, 50 years ago. And so this fall, we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary we have um, some activities planned to do that, which have been derailed, reshaped because of uh, COVID. But please um, look for material about the DAS's 50th anniversary, which is connected to the 50th anniversary of BAM 1, the Black Action Movement 1, which took place in, this, in uh, March. BAM strike took place in March of 1970. There's a lot more history and usefulness of the history that I'm only touching on in these, this short um, Great. Angie, would you like to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Justin and Stephen. I, I would just want to ask the question, do you believe that change is possible and necessary? Because if we are really going to do this, we have to recognize that the root of the problem is with power and policy. So devote your attention and your time to transforming power and policy. And then to Stephen's point, as we think about DEI and anti-racism, are you committed to creating a culture of anti-racism? And that requires that you have an understanding of what that means and that you're measuring things against that. You're measuring your policies, your actions, your words against that. Also, I think Justin mentioned this, but go beyond just naming that we are in a system of white supremacy, but name all the systems within it that uphold racist ideology. And I encourage you to explore and understand what the barriers to change are for yourself and for those that you are leading. And then make sure that you get the right people at the table, right? What does your team look like? What does your leadership look like? Who is making decisions? Who's benefiting from those decisions? Who's harmed by those decisions? And then just to reiterate this idea of accountability, create a culture of accountability. This is one of the most necessary things and leaders are being called to accountability, not because it's a bad thing, it's but because we need you. And so we need to be fierce in our truth telling and in our confrontation. Thank you, thank you so much. Our next question, how can we bring anti-racism into the curriculum at every school and college. Stephen, you talked a little bit about that. Would you like to add there? Uh, yes. Uh, um, and this means every school and college 
at U of M. Is that what the question is asking? Uh, I think it be I think it can be broadly defined, actually. Every school and college in the country. How do we bring anti-racism into the curriculum? Yeah, you can start at U of M if that's where you're comfortable. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it seems to me that this is a question uh, for Rob Sellers. And then perhaps also for uh, Mark Schlissel and Susan Collins, um, wh whose purview is the entire university. Um, it's not to say they haven't asked the question, um, but I'm not, I don't know. So this is a question for them. So, but it is, it is also a question for us. Um, it's gonna take, and, and I don't feel like I have a, a strong answer for that because the, every school and college has its own circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just at you. Um, but I think it will take some struggle. It will take some creating momentum and energy within each location, within each school and college. Um, I hear and then, and then forcing and trying to develop that to force uh, broader effort. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're already hearing from other questions that you've been posing, and I think as some of them emerging emerging in the Q and A, uh, that the people have found. Uh, roadblocks and resistance um, and distractions in their efforts. So perhaps another partial answer is for us to um, do forums like this and others which are, are, are smaller that we um, share with each other the struggles we're facing and strategize together. Yeah, Strat strategize and mobilize around these issues around curriculum I think would be, would be helpful for everyone. Um, so the next question is, what can I do as an ally? How can allies help? Angie, would you like to address that question? I would love to address that question. So again, I'm going to speak directly to my fellow white human beings. Um, well, just show up and speak up. The work of social justice and racial equity, to quote Ruth King, who wrote Healing Rage and Mindful of Race, is that this work is messy at best. So this means you're going to make mistakes and you're going to make a lot of mistakes. It means that probably we're going to get a lot more wrong than we're going to get right as we try to figure this out together. So as you show up and as you make mistakes, I'm inviting you to be willing to take hold of the opportunities that arise as a result. We are so resistant to being called racist. And when our black colleagues, friends, mentors, coaches call us out, it's our tendency to disbelieve and become defensive because we so badly don't want to be labeled as a racist. We don't want to be the bad ones. Mm -hmm. So what I'm encouraging you today is to just, man, the most important thing I could encourage you with is to show up with humility and with authenticity. As white people, we will only do better, see better, and be better human beings by being more fully authentic in our white skin and authentic in our relationships. If we can't hold what it means to be white, we can't hold what it means to be, to not be white. I know that th this is an illustration that has really helped me. If you imagine that white privilege is this wheel and you're one spoke in that wheel, even if you're doing the work and that one spoke is broken, that wheel is still turning and you're still benefiting. The wheel of racism continues to roll on. Awareness is not the change. It's the everyday work. It's how you behave. It's how you show up every day. It's hard and it's messy and it's uncomfortable. But people are dying. So let's have the hard conversations. I want to I want to close this idea of allyship with something with a quote 
from a black author. White folks need to move past their fear and call each other into deep, authentic, and embodied learning and unlearning around what it means to be white in this country. All of what that means, both the history and the present. White folks must dig in to our embodied racism, even, especially, if you think it's not there. And this is not just to shift what you say or how you shape your arguments or questions or Facebook posts or tweets. It's not about performing your wokeness. This isn't about what you say, it's about how you act. Stating that Black Lives Matter is a very minimum acknowledgement of humanity. The tenacity of the fight against this statement should absolutely stagger us and signal how far we have yet to go. Statements of solidarity must be actualized. We need more gentleness, more compassion, encouraged, embodied by white people. We need people, not performance. We need for expressions of black freedom, joy, grief, and rage not to cost us our lives. Thank you, Angie. Justin and Steven, would you like to add that to, to that question? If I could actually add to the previous question, I'm about, you know, bringing anti-racism into curriculum. I think I can bring a couple of things from like a student perspective. I think um, particularly, you know, so being in social work and business, I think there has to be a lot of unlearning and relearning. And so I'll start with social work. I think, um, you know, when you look at the canon of any kind of discipline, it's, you know, mostly going to be, you know, white men or white people generally that we attribute to finding, having founded, you know, certain um, disciplines um, and whatnot. And so naturally we want to teach these, you know, traditional um, texts and whatnot. But I think we have to be open to, you know, you know, diversifying what we're bringing to the classroom. I think we have to acknowledge the harm that some of these disciplines have done in excluding, you know, voices of color and the harm they've done to black communities. And that's a good start. I think it's also, you know, important to think about, you know, when we look at the historical exclusion of black people from a lot of these professions, they went and created, you know, their own shadow associations and trade groups and whatnot that, you know, outlined you know, their wants and their needs. And so I think looking at some of those struggles and looking at what those community, you know, when those communities and uh, associations were founded, um, the problems that they identified within certain professions and hope to incorporate that into the classroom. Um, I think when I look on the business side, you know, I think, again, that re-education has to be done. I remember talking to one of my faculty members who said, you know, the professors here, you know, are all products of the academy, they themselves. And so they too have to do some work in unlearning what they've been taught. And so I think, you know, to Nicole Hannah-Jones in the 1619 Project, mm -hmm. and they talk about, you know, American capitalism, how it's really in many ways built off of um, slavery and how, you know, um, the ways in which a lot of lessons and in, in, in management and, and, and whatnot is built off of slavery. And so on, on the business side, you know, are we going back and relearning and looking at where some of these practices actually came from and making sure that we're rooting them and where they came from and not necessarily, you know, just attributing them to white people or only teaching to, you know, the principles and, and texts that have been developed by white people. Thank you for adding that additional perspective. Debbie, um, I actually want to add a few things to that question as well, if I may. Uh-huh, yes. Uh, four things. Two of them come from the, I'll do it quickly. Two of them come <laughs> from the, two of them come from the, the um, program that Rob Sellers and Mark Sissel um, put on with several guests last Friday. Yeah. And the student, one of the undergraduate student raised the issue of R&E requirement. Mm -hmm. So to really rethink and redo and expand and maybe call it something different, but a new R&E requirement would be a concrete, concrete step toward infusing anti-racism in the curriculum. It won't do it alone, but again, I'm talking about a much more significant um, uh, requirement or something like that. Uh, secondly, uh, Eugene Rogers on that conversation mentioned the uh, program he did, The Seven Last Words. And he described how, when he did, I think five years ago, he said he couldn't use the words Black Lives Matter because people wouldn't, and donor, I think he said donors or others would not accept that. I think what we're talking about requires some boldness. And in that case, to stand up to them and tell them that you're wrong, that you 
even if you are a donor or a powerful person, you're used to getting your way. In this case, you need to learn to listen and accept this. And if you feel uncomfortable or challenging to you to use this language, compel them. And this has got to be from the, the leaders of the institution to compel them to listen, to open up and to hear what's going on. Um, and I know that sounds idealistic. And that's not how the world works, not how the institution works. So be it. If we're talking about infusing the curriculum of every college and school at this university, much less in the country, then we're talking about something that's um, uh, nearly impossible. We're talking about something very, so we're going to have to think um, boldly and um, imaginatively. Uh, along those lines, a way that we can do this, I think, is for the institution to be bold and courageous when it's confronted like challenges such as when Angela Day, I'm sorry, when Alice Walker was invited to campus. And because of her previous statements against Israel, which were characterized as anti-Semitic, um, because they were against the state of Israel, there was um, a lot of uh, pushback about her, um, the invitation. Now I recognize I'm, I'm, this is entering into really uh, um, fraught waters. But please be clear, let me be, try to be clear on the point I'm making. Alice Walker was invited by CW, if I recall correctly, because of her long record of uh, cultural work and an importance for the life and le black life and letters. And the, the opposition to her fails to recognize that. And so if the institution wants to be serious about confronting racism, about serious about confronting white supremacy and be serious about infusing anti-racism in the curriculum and by curriculum here I'm thinking especially to outside the classroom then it has to be willing to accept someone like her and to speak to those who see that and say that there's more to her than that that um, supposed uh, anti-semitic slogan and in, in fact it can be we could perceive that black people as a, an affront to us for her to be that way okay and um the fourth one is uh Students must demand it, along the lines of Justin was saying, okay, I'm done. Absolutely. Thank you for adding that perspective. Um, just for clarity, r &E requirement is race and ethnicity. And that conversation was wonderful um, last week, and we will include that in the resources that we'll send to you because we feel like it's worth a listen. So we'll get to a few of the questions that were submitted. We have one question that had 60 something likes, and that is, what are some of the best ways to recruit black students in research in a genuine way that isn't performative? She's in, or he, is in a STEM field where black women and men are grossly underrepresented. So the question is, what are some of the best ways to recruit black students in research in a genuine way? Who wants to start with that one? Justin. Yeah, I think from a student perspective, you know, when I'm coming to campus or thinking about a degree program, sure, I wanted to learn about, you know, the faculty and the social opportunities and career opportunities and whatnot, but you better believe as a black student, I'm gonna go seek out other black students and hear from a black perspective what that student experience is like. And so I think if you can create a positive experience for the black students that you currently have, they're gonna be your best advocate. They're gonna be the best messenger of you know what your school is providing, what your department is providing in that experience. And so if you're focusing on the students you currently have, centering their needs, creating a safe, as safe as possible and inclusive environment for them, they're gonna be your best ambassadors. And so I would really focus on the, you know, the current experience of black students. Stephen or Angie, did you want to add or no? I'll, I'll just say quickly, I think there are some efforts in various places throughout the campus have, have tried with various degrees of success um, to create research opportunities for black students. Um, and so we should learn from those that, that have been going and see how we can amplify and replicate those um, as well as adding additional opportunities or are... thank you so our next question is how can graduate students force our departmental faculty and administrators uh, for example chairs to be less weak and at least braver about confronting racism in a more generalized way lack of inc inclusivity 
in departments practice? They give examples, but I think that's the gist of the question. Justin, <laughs> I see you're unmuted, so I'm going to start with you. I think it's such a tough, a tough situation. I think when I, you know, when I first got to campus and started to see um, some, you know, opportunities for growth, you know, I tried to reach out to staff or faculty, you know, who I think could give me an inside perspective and whatnot. And I think one of the things they said early on is that, you know, students have a lot of power here, you know, um, understandably faculty and staff have other considerations, they're employees of the university. And so students oftentimes, you know, have the most power and can have a large platform. And so oftentimes that means, you know, organizing and using that power and, and creating a voice there. At the same time, I can say, you know, early on, it was disappointing and frustrating, I think, to be a, you know, tuition paying student here who's here to learn um, and not want to be burdened by having to hold institutions and, you know, department chairs, faculty administration accountable for my learning as a black student, but for the learning of all students in terms of not having, you know, white centered curriculum and whatnot. And so um, I think early on, I, you know, I very much wanted to just hold, you know, administration faculty accountable. I don't know that it's the most effective route. I think, unfortunately, it did require taking more action and, you know, organizing as students and using our voice and creating a platform. But I can only, I can hope that the more that faculty and administration, um, you know, are informed about, you know, anti-blackness, about white supremacy and its manifestation in higher ed, that they will be more emboldened and more courageous and stand to these values of diversity, equity, and inclusion that, you know, we hear not only at the Michigan University, at the University of Michigan, but at universities across the country. But I think, you know, until then, um, unfortunately, as students, that sometimes, that burden sometimes falls to us. Stephen? Yeah, was the question from the perspective of a student uh, asking how to, to compel the department chairs to, to act? Correct. That um, is how it appears. So if it's undergraduates, well, in either case, for undergraduate students or graduate students, one way would be to find other faculty members who they can be in league with and who, from that, their vantage point, can engage with, speak to, or put pressure on the chair. Um, if it, if for graduate students, undergraduate students, there's going to be a different set of, of ways to do that. But that, that would be one one step, I think. Thank you. That require, but I should say that requires faculty members to be willing to engage with the students, to listen to them, help them, and to join with them in coming up with the, the goals and the ways in which to engage and to to um, to push the chair. Angie. Yeah, I would just thank you, Stephen and Justin. And I would just add, you know, from an organizational perspective that this is why competencies and expectations are so important. And then accountability. If there's an expectation that faculty and administrators show up in certain ways and they're held accountable, then you're starting to change something about the systemic nature of which um, the students might have a different experience. And if I can add one more thing too, I think, you know, try and use to this point of accountability, use, you know, document, you know, documents or professional codes to the extent that you can. So if you're licensed or profession or discipline or something that, you know, re requires licensure, has some type of code of ethics, some, you know, are there standards in there that demand, you know, inclusivity or diversity, or you're at a school that has a strategic plan or related to diversity where they've outlined commitments to, you know, anti-racism or I think even with this latest rash of, you know, um, violence and the, the statements of solidarity that we're getting, you know, from institutions, hold institutions accountable to them. I think that's something that has been important to me, you know, again, looking at, you know, the Council on Social Work Education and their accreditation standards, there are specific standards that address diversity. And so those are opportunities and those are documents and tools that you can use to hold institutions accountable. And so um, that's been something that I think I have, have relied on and maybe a good starting point at your institution. That's a great point, Justin. Thank you for adding. So our next question is, how can we identify intergenerational trauma in our community? Oh, it just moved. How can we identify intergenerational trauma in our community and work to interrupt and alleviate the underlying issues. Uh, 
one um, partial step, I think, is to create the spaces for ongoing communication. So that um, students in particular have the opportunity to, to opportunities to express and process what they're feeling. And then that leads to identifying what subsequent steps the institution or those in the institution can or should take. Great. So we have um, just about nine more minutes. We have one other question um, that I thought was a great one. It says that someone in their 50s, and liked by a lot of people, and someone in their 50s, I've seen a wave upon wave of movements rise up to address these ongoing systematic issues. Yet, very little change from those in leadership positions. Is it enough to make, it's enough to make a person feel hopeless. What do you think is different about today's movement? And how can we ensure that real change will result from today's movement? I'd offer two points. I think in terms of generating hope, I think that's so essential um, to a movement. And I, you know, I've undoubtedly felt, you know, moments of weariness and despair, you know, in the past couple of weeks. And I really had to be intentional about thinking, how can I generate hope? And I think back to a quote that I put, you know, in my statement in applying to grad school um, that is at, um, at the memorial that Brian Stevenson built that talks about, I think it's a Mary McLeod Bethune quote, that she says, you know, if we could withstand the lash of slavery, you need to find what you can do in your day to move the struggle forward. And so I just think back to, you know, what my ancestors have had to endure in this country and thinking about, you know, the fact that here I am now, you know, at a graduate school on a panel, given a platform to speak explicitly about, you know, anti-blackness and white supremacy at a predominantly white institution um, and hold them accountable like that is progress. Is it where we want to be? No, but that's undoubtedly progress. And so, you know, I have to look back to see how far we've come to get hope. And I think the second thing to do is to look at the steps that you're taking. I think, um, you know, we're talking about systemic entrenched issues that we want to address. And oftentimes, you know, the steps and action that people are taking are marginal um, and piecemeal at best. So I think, you know, if we're talking about increasing representation, you know, over five years from you know one level of underrepresented to another level of underrepresented, that's not a that's not a systemic solution. And so I think we really have to think about you know putting forward some institutional systemic problem or uh, solutions that address these institutional systemic problems. If the goal is really you know a racially equitable and just world, you know think about the actions that you're proposing and how you're going to get to that point. Because I think oftentimes again the this, the steps that we're providing today don't get us to justice. They don't get us to equity. They, they, they're there to pacify and placate for, for the time being. And so really think about strategically and connect the steps you're taking today to the outcomes we hope to see. Thank you, Justin. I do want to read a comment. It wasn't a question, but I think it's important coming from a Black faculty member. And it says, please listen to what we say. Please reiterate what we say in meetings and give us the credit. Please invite us to coffee. Please invite us to be on panels and book collections. Please nominate us for awards. Please see us and help us not continue in our invisibility. And many thanks for asking. I think that's an important contribution. Um, we're close to our hour. One of the questions that we got repeatedly was, what actions can we take to build on this movement in history and create lasting change? And so to that, I have three things. One is to decide, to decide, this is gonna be the moment in history where we make lasting change. And then look at yourself, look inward to see what inner work that you can do around anti-racism. And this is for people of all races, including African-Americans, including white Americans. Everyone can look inside to see what you can do. Not that we shouldn't hold our leaders accountable, because we should. And we've learned that around the strategy and mobilizing, that's when we can make a lot of change. So continue to do that. But the third thing is to decide that it will be a sustained commitment. 
when the dust settles and the protest stops, how many of us are still going to be actively trying to do this work? And I think about myself. Um, I think about even if I was there for George Floyd's horrific murder, what would I have done? Like, would I have run and tried to tackle the police officer? I mean, it was awful to see. We all saw it. Or would I have been gripped by fear that then I would then die or then there would be someone on my neck, right? And it doesn't have to be murder. What about all the other things that I see, some kind of injustice happen, some policy that's not a great policy, things that I see that is not an inclusive environment? What did I do? And how, how many times has silence, my silence, been violence, right? So just thinking about what we can do, looking inward, each of us, and do that over and over and over and don't lose momentum. So what we're inviting you to do, we said that we would continue our conversation and we would love to do that. But we're also inviting you to make a sustained commitment, like every month, every 30 days say, you know what, I'm gonna continue this commitment so that in a year from now, we will get back to where we were and, and ask them the questions, what, are, what will be done? So for the next 12 months, every month, we'll send you an email on June 12th, that's today's date. One email a month for the next 12 months for a total of 12 emails. We'll ask you first to opt in and to see if you, we won't spam you. <laughs> we'll ask you first to, to opt in. But then if you opt in, then we'll give you the opportunity every month to think about what you committed to do. We'll, we'll ask you to commit, then we'll ask you to, we'll remind you of your commitment, and then we'll ask you to reflect on your commitment. We'll ask, how'd you do on that commitment that you had? And then um, you can respond, I'm doing great. Thanks, I'll continue this. Or you could say, I'm not doing well, but I want to recommit, right? You can always come back, always come back, just a decision. And then um, we'll ask you, we, we know that everyone won't do it, and that's okay. But what if a solid number of us decided to make this commitment over and over and over again? And we have what? 1,100 people, over 1,100 people on the webinar. What if we ask someone else to do it? We have over 200 people all over the, the, the United States. So what if other people at other institutions did it? And that's how we keep the momentum going and keep the sustained commitment. So we'll ask you to do that. One email once a month for a total of 12 months on June 12th. In addition to that, on the 12th of every month, in addition to that, we will continue the conversation. We still have lots of questions that weren't answered, even at registration, either at registration or um, that you submitted today. And we want to continue to have these conversations and we will do that one hour every month for the next 12 months or as long as there's interest. And so we invite you to come back. We'll have different guests. We invite you to come back and join us. And, and just continue to recommit. So um, we know that with reminders, with um, reflection, with accountability, we'll be more likely to have a sustained commitment. With that, I wanna thank you all for being with us today and um, for making a commitment to be here. I wanna thank our leaders who's also joined us, um, Dean Mike Solomon, the Dean of Rackham Graduate School, has joined us today, as well as our Chief Diversity Officer and Vice Provost, Rob Sellers. We appreciate your time. We appreciate our guests for sharing your experience and expertise. Thank you for joining us. I know for a fact that you all are doing the work, <laughs> lots of work, and I appreciate you. What we will send you immediately following this webinar is an overwhelming number of resources, right? Enough to keep you busy for quite the long time. We will send you those resources right away, as well as the link that asks you if you want the reminder. And we invite you to join us for continued conversations. With that, I'll say thank you so much for all of you who spent time with us today and have a good day. Bye.